Great. All right, so thank you all for joining us today. We are going to be reviewing common documentation errors for erythropoiesis stimulating agents, uh, appeal claims that are seen by our appeals department, as well as providing a quick overview of the appeal process. My name is Rachel Wood. I'm one of the nurse analysts with Provider Outreach and Education. I'm joined by my coworkers, uh, Mary Sue Gardner and Jennifer uh, Bonifus. They are going to be monitoring the chat today. And any questions that you do have as I go through our slides this morning, you can enter those into our chat and select all panelists when sending. We did provide this session on August 9th. And that was held in the afternoon, so I do just want to highlight that I am going to be going through the same information that was talked about um, August 9th. So if you did attend that, um, FYI, this is going to be going over some information you've already heard. We did just want to provide this on an, a different date in the morning for those providers that might not have been able to make that afternoon session. So regarding materials for this webinar, those were available and sent through the uh, WebEx platform. Additionally, we did send an email out this morning that did include those slides. So if you were registered prior to uh, today's event, uh, those were sent out. I sent them out about 7 a.m. this morning. And then finally, to receive the Certificate of Achievement for today's uh, webinar, all you have to do is stay on for the entirety. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in our closing slides as well. Um, but you know, all you have to do is sit tight and listen to our slides. All right. Okay, so on our slide here, we just have a list of acronyms that I'll use throughout our presentation. So if you have any questions on anything we're going through, uh, you can refer back to this slide for what that abbreviation is. And then really quick, this is our disclaimer. So basically what our disclaimer is telling us is that this education is for informational purposes only. Medicare does change their rules often and our education is based off of the rules and guidelines as they stand today. So if Medicare does come out with any updates on any of the information I talk about following today's call, that does trump this presentation this morning. Additionally, as I said, I am recording this so no need to record this yourself. And we will be posting this as an encore presentation on our YouTube page. Uh, so, you know, no need to record it. We will be, again, putting this out there for you to view um, once we close today if you want to, you know, check anything or have any of your coworkers take a look at this as well. All right. So our goal for today's webinar is to review doc the documentation requirements for a, a erythropoiesis stimulating agents, otherwise referred to as ESA claims. And hopefully uh, going through this information will help uh, avoid some of these future denials as well as the uh, claims needing to be upheld on our first level review in the appeal process. So I'll start by providing a broad overview of what ESAs are, what does that mean, uh, as an FYI, I'm not going to be going into a very in-depth review of ESA coverage or billing for every covered diagnosis that our NCD and LCD talks about. That um, would likely be a separate presentation. So I am just going to be providing a broad overview on, you know, what ESAs are. Following that, we will talk about a little bit about the appeals process and how our nurse reviewers come into play for that appeals uh, process. And I do want to point out that if people have been listening to some of our more recent documentation uh, reviews on errors, these have typically re been related to our medical review nurses and review outcomes on TPE claims. So that does differ than what we're talking about today. We're talking about reviews done on the appeal level. So these are for claims that are already denied and then providers you know, came back around and submitted an appeal. The reason we're talking about appeals, this is something that uh, a lot of providers have questions on, and we haven't done a ton of education relating to, you know, documentation uh, examples and some of the clinical related topics. So we wanted to just you know, kind of expand our horizons a little bit there. And then finally, uh, we're gonna be looking at the top denial reasons that we see for these claims. So we have a couple denial letters that I will pull up as well, and we'll go through those examples. 
We will have likely a few minutes for questions at the end. I do want to preference, uh, preference that if you do have questions and uh, we cannot get to that question in the chat or it's something that we can't answer, we will be responding via email following today's presentation. So just be aware that we can't answer your question today. We will get you a response. All right, so let's start with answering what is a ESA. So these drugs um, are drugs that stimulate the production of red blood cells. The purpose of ESA interventions is to treat anemia associated with chronic kidney disease, cancers, or MDS. So these are used when other causes or solutions for anemia have already been ruled out. ESAs stimulate the bone marrow to make more red blood cells and are FDA approved for use in reducing the need for blood transfusions in patients that have um, specific clinical indications, uh, again, those that are covered um, through our NCD and LCDs. And on our slide here, we just have two examples of common ESA stimulating or ESA agents that uh, you would see and likely utilize in your practice. All right, so for ESAs, depending on the diagnosis, we either use the NCD or L our LCD to base our reviews uh, for, you know, based on what we're going to be looking for and the basis for our coverage requirements. So we just wanted to take a second here and talk about what the difference between these two documents are. So on our slide, we have information on and a description of what NCDs are. So NCDs, or National Coverage Determinations, these are determined by Medicare, and they apply across all MACs. So uh, these do differ from our next slide here, which are LCDs, or Local Coverage Determinations. These apply on a local level. They're determined um, by max, per max, you know, max by max, and they can vary from based off who is your max. So WPS might have some different guidelines than, you know, say somebody that is falls in the jurisdiction in California. So again, as I said, these are determined at the local level. They're typically going to uh, define medical necessity for the services that are provided. And there are some LCDs that are collaborative, so all MACs look at the guidelines together and come up with, uh, you know, a similar coverage criteria that they're following. Uh, but again, these are going to be something that may vary on the local level. And so um, here we do have the coverage guidelines for both the national coverage uh, determined decisions and the local coverage determinations. So we can put links to these in our chat as well if you would like to take a look at that or just have those links as reference. And so as I mentioned and why we're talking about NCD versus LCD, uh, depending on what the diagnosis or the ESA is treating, the coverage guidelines can be found in either the NCD or our LCD. So for cancer diagnosis, we utilize our NCD and we use our LCD for uh, ESAs that are used to, to treat chronic kidney disease or MDS. Our LCD is then divided into three subgroups. So group A has coverage guidelines for end-stage renal disease on dialysis. Group B, coverage guidelines for chronic kidney disease not on dialysis. And then group C, indications other than renal disease. So again, not going to be talking about each of these in super uh, in-depth information, but we did want to point out uh, you know, the differences and the subgroups in our LCD. All right, so now that we've established what ESAs are and the coverage, where to find the coverage guidelines for them, let's talk about our appeals process. So this information is also on our website, and we do have a link to that article that we'll put in our chat. I can it contains a little bit more information than what I'll talk about today. So once an initial claim determination is made, any party uh, that uh, to that initial determination has the right to appeal the Medicare coverage and payment decision within uh, certain, certain circumstances. So the redetermination, this is the level one of the appeal process. 
uh, this is the only level that the uh, Part A and Part B match, so that's us at WPS, uh, take part in and perform. The timeline and the redetermination level is 120 days from the date of receipt of notice, uh, of notice of the initial determination. So the second level of the appeal process is a reconsideration. This is processed by a, qual a qualified independent contractor or QUID, and providers here have 180 days from the date of receipt of the redetermination uh, to move forward with that reconsideration. All right, so as I said, there um, are multiple levels of the Medicare appeals process. There are a total of five distinct levels, and the next three here are listed on our slide. So level three it would be the administrative law judge or ALJ hearing. Next, you have level four, the departmental appeals board or DAB review. And then finally, the final level of that appeals process is level five, uh, federal court review. So we are not going to be talking about these today, but we did want to provide this information to you. And it also, again, can be found on our website. Uh, again, the MACs are responsible for that first level, but we wanted just to, you know, make you all aware of those next levels in the appeals process. One thing I want to uh, point out with filing appeals is that you do need to follow the order of the levels. So what I mean by that is starting at level one, moving on to level two, and so on. I mention that because sometimes we see providers that want to skip a step, uh, skip a level, and we just want to point that out that that's not going to be something that speeds the process up for you. If anything, it might uh, unfortunately delay your appeal review because we are going to look back and see what happened at that prior level. Um, and so just be mindful of that. All right, so what is the nurse reviewer role in the appeals process? If we need additional documentation to process an appeal, the party submitting the appeal, so that could be the uh, provider, the supplier, should obtain and submit the documentation within that prescribed time period following notification of an initial determination. So this information is then reviewed by our nurses in our appeals department. Providers and suppliers are responsible for submitting documentation uh, that does support you know, why they think the initial determination, uh, you know, in a, this case would be a denial, was incorrect under Medicare coverage and payment policies. You may submit, uh, you may supply this documentation with the appeal request, um, or you can wait for the request of um, your contractor, so us at WPS. Failure to send in the requested documentation in a timely manner may result in processing delays for your appeal. So just be aware of that. You want to get that information into us uh, as soon as you can. Providers should submit that documentation, as I said, related to that initial denial reason, but you do not need to resubmit previously submitted documentation. The information that was sent in to us on for that initial determination, uh, that is going to all be forwarded over to our appeals department. So with submitting information and documentation, you can use the WPS GHA provider portal to submit um, and check the status of your appeal. Registered users of the secure side of our portal do have the ability to uh, perform a number of appeals functions. And we do have the portal user manual. Uh, we have a link to that we can put into the chat if you'd like to take a look at that. The uh, portal, portal user manual outlines the steps and contains some really helpful screenshots to use for step-by-step -step instructions on how to use the portal for uh, various ways uh, to look at your appeal. So again, submit only documentation in the portal that is new information that justifies the medical necessity of your claim. And additionally, uh, talking about the portal, one last thing I want to just talk about is uh, duplicate submissions. So please do not send in multiple submissions of your appeal. Uh, just check the status to see uh, what's going on, and you can do that through the portal. Redeterminations and reconsideration staff, you have 60 days to make a decision once that uh, information has been put in. 
But oftentimes we some will see providers automatically send in a second request at 30 days. So um, don't do this. It's not going to be something that speeds up your appeal process. And um, you know, wait until that 60-day mark. But you can uh, request or, or check the status in the appeal portal. Or I'm sorry, the provider portal. All right. So now that we've established what ESAs are and reviewed the basics of the appeal process, I want to talk about documentation elements we have um, and we're looking for for all ESA claims. So remember, there are a lot of different diagnoses that our LCD and NCD covers, and the uh, information and some of the criteria will be diagnosis specific. So there'll be a couple different documentation elements that may apply depending on what you're using ESAs for. But we did want to take some time to talk about information that applies to all of these claims. So all documentation must be maintained in the patient medical record and made available to the contractor uh, on request. Every page of the record must be legible and include appropriate patient identification information. So the person's name, their date of birth, the dates of service that apply, and so on. That documentation must include a legible signature of the physician or non-physician practitioner responsible for and providing care to the patient. The medical record must support the use of the ICD-10 code and describe the service that was performed as it relates to those, uh, you know, ICD-10 codes build that you build. For any ASA claim, the medical record must reflect that the, this therapy for the individualized patient is reasonable and necessary. So we're looking for documentation that supports the uh, most recent blood pressure and shows that that blood pressure is uh, reasonable, it, uh, demonstrates reasonable control, not in significant excess to the baseline range for that given patient. We're also looking for the weight in kilograms. Uh, the date and results of the hematocrit or hemoglobin levels prior to the administration of ESA therapy. And we'll talk more about that in our next slide. Uh, evidence of assessment ruling out other causative factors of anemia, or if those causative factors are present, that they have been uh, managed and that it is still necessary to move forward with the, that ESA um, intervention. And then finally, we're looking for documentation of the dose used and the route of administration. All right, so that's the basic of documentation information for all of the ESA claims that we're going to be reviewing for. So on our slide here, I want to talk about common denial reasons uh, that claims are denied and then upheld for the at the redetermination level. So some of these reasons are going to be diagnosis uh, specific, and we do have that listed on our slide. So we'll start with uh, ESAs for CKD. So uh, the top thing that we see here is missing GFR or creatinine results. And then we'll go down to uh, ESA for MDS. Often we see with this is that there is a missing bone marrow biopsy report, and uh, this report must uh, confirm the diagnosis of MDS. So those apply to the, uh, you know, diagnosis specific, specific information. And then the next one on our slide here apply to all ESA claims. So a missing provider signature is something we see very often, and then missing hemoglobin or hematocrit results. So in the next couple of slides, our nurses in our appeals department gave us a couple screenshots of documentation examples of what we're looking for at WPS. So on our slide here is an example of GFR and creatinine results. So as I mentioned, this is a documentation requirement for ESAs uh, treating uh, CKD. It is the most common reason that we cannot pay for a ESA and CKD appeal, and providers often do not include this information in the appeal documentation that they send in. So the GFR must be less than 60, or the creatinine either greater than or equal to three. So um, typically, if the provider 
uh, does not or does provide these labs uh, with the appeal, the results are normally sufficient to meet the medical necessity requirements that we have uh, outlined. So next up, we have uh, an example of a sufficient bone marrow biopsy report. So this is required documentation for ESA uh, treatment in MDS. It is the most common reason that we're not able to pay for those ESA and MDS appeals. And oftentimes, providers don't adequately send this information in with those in, that documentation that they send in to support their appeal. So the report must confirm the MDS diagnosis. And the actual bone marrow biopsy report uh, does need to be included. That is something we are reviewing and looking for. It cannot just be a note in the provider's progress note that says something like bone marrow biopsy confirming MDS prior to, uh, you know, X, Y, and Z date. So this is documentation that, uh, this documentation is a requirement that our LCD does list. So that is what we are reviewing off of that information in our LCD. Uh, one thing that got brought up in our last presentation, and I wanted to mention with um, uh, claims for MDS relating to your, your EPO level, this is something that uh, we did bring up in our last presentation I just wanted to address here. It, EPO level and receiving that information was something that we previously did deny for on appeals, but we are no longer denying if that is something not included. Uh, for this diagnosis. So I did just want to mention that uh, today on, you know, with this information. All right, and then finally, we have an example of hemoglobin and hematocrit results. So for all ESA uses, so CKD, MDS, and cancer, the hemoglobin must be either uh, greater than 10 or the hematocrit greater, or I'm sorry, less than 10 or the hematocrit less than 30. Uh, in the example below, the hemoglobin is too high, and the hematocrit, however, is um, 29.8. So that would meet the criteria in our LCD and NCD. Uh, one thing to point out here is that a hemoglobin of 10 or a hematocrit of 30 is not sufficient. It does need to be less than um, those levels that I mentioned. So hemoglobin less than 10, or hematocrit less than 30. It is not required to have both of those hematocrit and hemoglobin results submitted. Typically, the lab results will come together, so we do typically receive both. Uh, we do just need one to meet those, um, those number guidelines, that coverage guideline that is outlined in our policy to meet the medical necessity point there. Um, but again, typically we do receive both because they come in, in the uh, lab panel. So typically also as regarding the date of the time frame of how um, close we want these lab results to be relating to the start of the ESA in uh, therapy. So these results, we typically see providers are doing them either on the date of service that the ESA was provided or close to that. Um, the timeline for these labs, uh, we can accept the hemoglobin or hematocrit results as long as they are within the last seven days. This is something that we uh, have recently clarified with our uh, CMDs. It was something that was brought up in our last presentation as well. Uh, it's a relatively new piece of information. So if you've submitted a claim in the past and this was something that you received a denial on, um, be aware that we are, you know, up, uh, I would say updating how we are reviewing these claims. And we did previously deny on values that were beyond just a few days. But again, as I said, moving forward, we are going to be accepting hemoglobin and hematocrit values that are within uh, seven days of the ESA start of therapy. All right. So uh, with that, I want to now move on and pull up a couple uh, examples for our denial letters. And this is what, are, uh, what providers will receive as the explanation of why your redetermination was upheld on, you know, again, that first level of appeal review. So with these letters are pretty wordy. Uh, we did highlight a couple key areas to pay attention to. 
And we do have two examples. The first one is for a cancer diagnosis, and the second one is for a um, a, uh, the, 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 a chronic kidney disease. So I am switching over to that. I do want to just make sure that you guys are seeing my uh, screen and it's showing a letter. Um, if, if Mary Sue or uh, Jennifer could just confirm, I'm showing the actual denial letter. Okay, sounds good. My screen just looked a little funky on my end, so I wanted to make sure before talking and not showing the right thing. All right, so on our uh, first example here, uh, this is what providers are going to, again, be sent with uh, regarding the decision of the redetermination. So I'm not going to be reading this word for word, but I do want to point out some of the key sections. So I'm going to scroll down to the areas that we've highlighted for you to pay attention to. So this denial letter is for a claim that was initially denied for ESA to treat anemia in neoplastic disease. So this is a cancer diagnosis and will follow the coverage criteria in our NCD. So that is what the first highlighted paragraph here reviews. Uh, it goes over information on what the NCD coverage criteria does include. So ESA for uh, covered, can uh, covered cancer diagnosis, the supporting documentation should include uh, that hemoglobin and hematocrit results uh, prior to the start or maintenance of the ESA therapy. We're also looking for the medication administration records or the MAR. And um, there, you know, those are the things that we highlighted here in what our NCD uh, coverage guidelines um, are. So that is the first paragraph we wanted to highlight. And then if you move down to the second highlighted paragraph, we uh, see what the nurse that reviewed what her findings or their findings were. So upon review, uh, this sentence includes what we, again, were missing and found was missing when we did our review. So in this case, for this uh, claim, the documentation did not include a signed physician medication order to support the services billed. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit more to um, this last section that we want to highlight in the appeal um, appeal determination letter, and uh, this information here uh, should match the information in the upon review section. Um, it tells providers what to submit if you want to go to that next level um, of appeal, so that second level with the reconsideration uh, with the the uh, quit. So. We want to emphasize that with this information, um, we really are trying to help you get your claims paid uh, when appropriate, and we want to have, you know, kind of guide you through what information we are missing and why it's not being paid. Uh, because again, that is our goal, to have this process be very easy for providers or as easy as we can make it, and ultimately to get claims that are appropriately um, should be paid, uh, paid, you know, when, when meeting all the guidelines. We do have to follow the Medicare requirements that, you know, again, are outlined in our guidelines, so the NCD and the LCD, um, but we want providers to have success in correctly getting those claims paid. All right, so I'm going to jump over to our second example, and again, this is a decision letter. I'm going to be scrolling through most of it. Uh, but what this decision letter is for, it is for an ESA claim that is being used to treat CKD. So I'm going to scroll right down to um, our first and second paragraph, same information that I kind of highlighted on that uh, cancer claim that held um, information regarding the NCD. This one talks about our LCD because that is what we are using to review ESA for chronic kidney disease. So our first highlighted paragraph, this explains what we're looking for in the notes. So we want to see signed physician orders, the MAR, the hematocrit, and uh, hemoglobin levels, and the GFR or creatin results within the last 30 days. So in our review, and this is in our second paragraph here, the documentation sent in uh, shows that 
the hemoglobin for this person was 10.5 and the hematocrit was 34.1 on the date of service um, for the ESA treatment. So as I've mentioned, these are higher than the values and for that reason, this claim did not meet our medical necessity requirements. And then I'm gonna scroll down to our third area we wanted to highlight. So again, this is what to include with your reconsideration um, if you want to move forward to that second step. So here we would wanna see different uh, lab values that show the levels for this person is are, are below 10 or 30. All right, and so I'm gonna hop back over to our slides. And I did, uh, you know, kind of highlight in those last two sections of the denial example, the reconsideration process or that second level of the appeal. So we wanted to provide some information on, you know, where to go for that if you decide that's what your next step would be. So there's no minimum dollar amount required to request a reconsideration. We did include a link to the reconsideration form. Um, so that information uh, with the appropriate quit address uh, should be on our slide here. And also that form is something that is included in, I believe the last page of the redetermination letter. So those letters that we just uh, looked at should also have some information on how to move forward with the second level appeal. Uh, we can put links to this, I believe, in our chat as well. And as far as mailing, uh, you, the mailing address, I'm not gonna read this to you all, but that is on our slide here for um, any information that would need to be sent in for that, that uh, reconsideration. All right, and then before we pause for uh, questions, we have just a couple more uh, resources and helpful links on this slide. These mainly apply to our appeal process, so information on our YouTube that our YouTube channel that has a lot of good videos on, uh, you know, all things appeals. We have a link to our appeal section to our website, and then the Med Medicare Medicare Learning Network article that talks um, about some details from Medicare as well. All right, and I just want to pause briefly on our survey slide here. So uh, what we have is our QR code and a link to our survey. If you've attended our events, um, you know, we, we've, we've been talking about our survey a lot and we uh, really have been loving the responses that we get from all of the providers, all of the comments and what you like, what you don't like. We've gotten a lot of great education suggestions from these survey responses. So uh, your feedback is very invaluable to us, and it helps us ensure that we're providing education to you that's, you know, timely and effective and makes, uh, gives you the most bang for your buck, if you will. So there are a couple different options to take this survey. You can either uh, use the QR code on our slide here. Uh, this is also going to be in the next couple slides, and you can do that using your uh, iPhone. You just open your camera and hover over this this picture and a, a link should pop up that you can select and take. Uh, we also have a link embedded in our slide that we also put in our chat as well. All right, so I wanna pause here and see if there are any questions that uh, we want to address. Hi, Rachel. There are some questions that have come through. Um, one of them might be a little more specific to lead away from appeals, um, but I will pose the question for you guys. And the first one is, will the services be denied if it's billed without an ICD-10 code as listed in the local coverage article or the LCA, even if the physician provides compelling documentation from um, administration to the patient without the listed diagnosis code. So basically, um, what uh, I'm kind of posing the question to lead away, what would uh, the appeals department do if the diagnosis code used on the claim was not supported in the LCA? Mm 
And lead away, you might be double muted if you are speaking. We, we, we can always check with her offline and get a follow up to that question just to be sure. Um, cause I think, look, maybe she might, um, be having trouble getting off mute. But the, I, I would, I don't want to speak for the appeals with, I would think that the cover diagnosis does need to be one of the ones included in our LTA. Um, but, oh, and she's raising her hand. Maybe she can't unmute herself. Um, maybe we have a hard time unmuting her as well. Yeah, so, I'm trying to, trying to figure that one out, but, um, which again is fine. Um, as Rachel yeah. was saying, um, and if lead away, you want to just put some information in the chat, that's great too. But, um, the, the covered diagnoses you know, that are in the LCA need to be followed. Providers do have the right, you know, and anyone that has appeal rights to submit an appeal on, um, you know, whatever they want. You could send that additional documentation as listed or as they said that the physician has, it, it will be looked at. I can't say for sure that it would be, you know, considered for overturn though. So follow the documentation requirements and the diagnosis requirements listed in the LCD and the LCA. Um, and while we're trying to get her unmuted, uh, which I don't know why that's not working, but that's an us issue. Um, we will just move on. Uh, which policy, the NCD or the LCD, is used if a patient have a cancer diagnosis and chronic kidney disease? That's a great question. I would think it depends on why they are receiving the ESA, um, you know, what's the provider's rationale for providing the um, the ESA treatment to them. So if it's something that, I guess the primary diagnosis, and I know patients can have, you know, multiple things going on, but um, I think that would be a provider, a provider judgment. And just depending on, you know, what their treatment plan looks like and how you guys are um, planning to, you know, bill for that. Um, but again, I think that if that's not the, right response, then I will follow up following today's presentation if, you know, our, our, we uh, we chat with our appeals and, and potentially even our MR nurses and they, they tell us otherwise. But I would think it would be a provider, uh, you know, what, what the rationale is for doing, um, doing the ESA treatment for that person. No, I would agree with you, Rachel. I think it, you know, it's when you're thinking about this patient and the patient that has two, two qualifiable conditions, um, what are we treating that patient for today? And that would be the coverage guidelines that you would follow. So today it may be for the cancer. Tomorrow it may be for uh, the chronic kidney disease. So, Again, the treatment would come down to like what what is the patient being treated for today? Uh, all right, let me move on and to, to, to well, and it looks test. like um, I think we got some. Thank you, Leadaway, for your. I see you put some information in the chat um, answering. I think this next question. Sorry to cut you off, Mary Sue, but I think it's answering the the labs for C. So the, the question is for lab levels for CKD and the patient is receiving maintenance, um, does the treatment still need to be uh, less than 10 or, or less than 30? And I'll just read this to the group. 
Um, the response would be for ESAs, we are looking at the documentation, so the order, the MAR, hematocrit, hemoglobin within the last seven days um, for all. For MDS, we also need bone marrow biopsy with um, MDS diagnosis and cancer. We also need to see the records. Oh, so maybe this is answering that the question that I just put in. Um, so when you record patient is recently completed in chemo and CKD, uh, we need a GFR within the last 30 days uh, to meet that medical necessity requirement. So I apologize. I thought that was answering. So for the maintenance um, levels for CKD is receiving maintenance treatment. Uh, I, my understanding is, yes, we would still need to keep those levels within that uh, range. but I will be corrected if, if appeals has says differently. So, um, any other questions that we, we can't come through? Nope, it looks like Lita Way did provide some clarification um, on the diagnosis. Um, so, she said if you are able to submit sufficient documentation, we do not need one of the listed covered diagnoses. So please submit that all information to support why, why there is a diagnosis that is um, not listed in the, in the local coverage article. And yes, for the maintenance, they still need to be less than 10 or less than 30. All right. All right. So that is all we have. We are at 945. So on behalf of myself and the rest of our team, uh, thank you for attending. And we look forward to reading those survey comments and having you join in on future events with us. So you may now disconnect.